Hi everyone, today we're going to be talking about some advanced lighting techniques in Blender with the Cycles rendering engine. For other video I'll be showing you a variety of demonstration files that you can pick up on Gumroad. There's a free and a paid version of the package. The free package contains simple demonstration scenes, whereas the paid version contains more fleshed out artistic scenes that you can dissect to see how they were made. Before we start I should also mention that Martin from CG Boost has also recently done a fantastic video about lighting characters for storytelling, so if you're interested in this subject then I can highly recommend checking that out as well. But in this video we're not going to be talking about lighting for a specific type of artwork, instead I'll be showing you a few rendering techniques and features that can quite often get overlooked. Most of these are specific to Cycles because it's a path tracing engine, whereas EV being a rasterization engine doesn't have the same fidelity when it comes to simulating the physicality of light. The first thing we're going to talk about is transmission. Transmission is essentially a measure of how much information behind the object can be seen through it. I think most people only think to use transmission when creating glass or polished minerals of some kind, but I'm here to tell you that the applications of transmission are far greater than just that. See here how we have a curtain in front of our character model. Behind the character is an emissive light source which we'll talk about a bit later. Light is able to pass through this curtain, but not all of it, and that's the key point, because by controlling the physical properties of the material we can get these cool faded light bleeding effects. Now the keen-eyed amongst you might have also noticed I've reduced the alpha value on this principled BSDF shader. That's because transmission alone might not let you see as much as you want to. By balancing the two we can get a good compromise between visibility, blurring and light bleeding. See what happens if I leave the alpha at 0.7 and reduce the transmission all the way. We miss out most of the light bleeding and blurring. Likewise if I increase both the transmission and the alpha to their maximum values we get both the bleeding and the blurring effect but the blur is very intense, probably too much to identify the proper shape. Reducing the alpha value from here progressively reduces the blur until we're back at our original effect. So what kinds of things can this be used for? Well immediately this demonstration gives me ideas for a medical lab with draping plastic separators where we can get a blurry glimpse of an operation happening behind. If we jump over to one of the paid demos you can see how I've used transmission to let the back railing leave a shadowy impression on the curtains. But there's something more I can show you. Because of the wonderful power of nodes, we can apply all sorts of generative or mathematical processes to change the look of the transmission. You can see here that I've got a Voronoi texture with a color ramp plugged into the transmission value. The mapping coordinates are generated from the camera transform. On the Voronoi I'll make the scale 2 and the randomness 0. Now you can see these squares, which are areas where the transmission value is lower than the surrounding area. Taking advantage of this you could create some really cool materials and surface effects. Ok now we're going to move on to light bouncing, which might otherwise be described as global illumination, but we'll call it light bouncing because it's an obvious description. What I'm talking about is how light and colour data bounces from one surface onto other objects in the scene. Now this isn't much of a secret but I know that quite a lot of people don't often think to use this kind of illumination as an actual technique for lighting a subject. See here how the light from the brown floor is bouncing back onto the faces of the character that are pointing downwards. This is a perfectly viable way to emphasise the contours of a shape. Just to demonstrate this more, let's take a look at the position of the lights in the scene. Here you can see that I have two area lights behind where the character is. A purple one is pointing diagonally upwards, filling the scene with colour, and a white one is pointing diagonally downwards. The light from this one will create a highlight around the character, and the excess light that hits the floor will bounce back up. You'll also notice that we have a weak volume permeating throughout the scene, but we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. To increase the strength of this bouncing effect, there's a few things we can do. We could increase the strength of the upper light, however we know this would also increase the intensity of the highlight around the character. We can see this now if I turn the power up to 5000. Of course everything is blown out and not very balanced at all. The second option is to change the floor material. Again for the sake of demonstration I have just a basic principled BSDF shader. If I increase the brightness of the base colour value then more light is reflected back up to the character as we can see here. And because colour data is also carried by the simulated rays, if I change it to a different colour you can see how this is also projected onto the character. As I said, a lot of the time people don't really think about this kind of bounce lighting. It's just something that happens regardless of what you do, and if it looks good then that's a happy accident. But if there's anything I want you to take away from this, it's maybe try to learn to use the side effects of a renderer as an artistic tool. Now before we move on to the next demo I just want to quickly mention the presence of the volume in this scene. This is set up through the world nodes, and I use volumes to create background gradients in scenes that need empty space filled. If you keep the colour of the volume grayscale then it will accurately adopt colour of the surrounding light objects. The brightness of the volume in any single area will depend on its closeness to one of the lights, and this helps to make the transition from a highlight to empty space more natural. See how strange this looks with the volume disabled. 
Okay, now we're going to move on to one of my favorite features in Cycles, and that's lighting by emissive materials. Let's open up one of the demos in the free version. A lot of my work relies on physical emissive elements, and being able to use them as light sources opens up a huge world of possibilities. It's quite often been the case recently that my artwork does not use any traditional light sources, no lamps, no HDRIs, only emission and reflection. So let's talk about why. With traditional lamp objects, you are restricted to a finite point the light can emit from. Area lights are cool because they give you a larger surface for light to emit, however I'm sure those of you that have used them before know that as you increase the size, you oftentimes have to play with the strength value to get it looking right, and that's a little bit tedious. But a benefit to area lights is that they don't show up in renders as physical objects. But what I like about using emissive materials is that they do have a real physical presence. It's consistent, and because the lighting is controlled by nodes, it means that you can get super creative and mathematical with it if you really wanted to. Light emits from all across the material, and just to prove this, I can change the colour of this emissive strip from plain white to a gradient of pink and blue. See how the colour blends so well across this entire room. If you tried to recreate this with lamps alone, it would take a lot of trial and error, and once you got it right, it would be a pain to change anything. I said it once and I'll say it again, emissive light is one of my favourite features of cycles. But seeing it in a closed demo scene like this is all well and good, but what about using it for actual artwork? Well, come with me over to one of the files in the paid package. Some of you may recognise this, it's an adaptation of one of my demos from the modular environment design with Blender video. All of the light in this scene comes from emissive materials, there are no lamps or HDRIs whatsoever. The only downside for having this much fidelity with the lighting simulation is that it takes longer to render. You can see that as I move the camera, calculating the samples is taking longer than the previous demos. Combining this with highly reflective materials also gets some really cool effects. Let's take a look at the last paid demo. This was a piece of environment art that I didn't end up putting into a video of its own. You might have also seen this in the thumbnail for my recent video on procrastination, and I briefly showed it in my first livestream. Unlike the last demo, there is some extra world lighting going on, but it's not an HDRI, just white fill light. However, there's a lot of emissive material lighting going on. You can see clues for this in the reflection of the spheres on the right. If I move the viewport camera around, you can see these strips laying on the ground of the scene, and these are providing some highlights and some interesting reflections for the objects. Ok, so let's combine the techniques that we've learned so far and see what happens. I've taken one of my previous character concepts called Sergeant Butters, which you can get on Gumroad. I put him into the transmission demo from earlier. As a disclaimer, this file is not included in the demo packages, you'll have to pick up the character separately. Ok, the last technique that we're going to talk about for this video is less to do with light and colour, and more to do with preemptive compositing. Sometimes you might want to render an object that's being influenced by an HDRI without actually having the HDRI showing up in the background of the render. This is something that's quite easy to achieve by only using a few nodes, and I use this all the time. If we take a look in the world nodes for this last free demo, you will see the surface of the world is a mix of two shaders. One of them is an HDRI, provided by HDRIHaven.com, which I highly recommend you go and check out. The other is a basic RGB colour node. To tell the renderer which of these we want to be the background of the render, we need to create a light path node and then plug the is camera ray output into the fact input of the mix shader node. Now the HDRI is no longer being displayed as the world background, even though the objects are still being affected by it. Ok, let's take a minute to talk about the sponsor for this video, which is Sketchfab. You may already know Sketchfab for providing the best 3D model viewer for the web, but you might not know that they actually have an online store for buying and selling 3D models. You can use the built-in model inspector to preview the geometry of the mesh, along with all the textures so you know exactly what you're getting. There's a wide variety of content available, and a good number of dedicated artists providing high quality content. If you're interested in maybe selling your own models on the store, then you can also consider applying to become a seller. So thanks for sponsoring this video, Sketchfab. Now just before we close this up, a few days ago I put a notice on my Instagram seeing if anyone wanted to get some questions answered in this video. So I'll answer some of those now while you watch some footage of my recent walk through the English country. Have you considered doing a video about animation nodes slash Sverchok or Sorkar? Yeah, I've actually already done a video on animation nodes, but I don't have that much interest in doing another one in the short term. Don't get me wrong, the add-on is fantastic, and it definitely suits my interests, however that single video that I did is responsible for nearly half of all the troubleshooting requests I've received, which is quite impressive given that I distribute tools and Python add-ons for Blender. It's largely due to a version mismatch and features of either Blender or animation nodes being changed over time. So I've said to people that I'll do more programmatical node stuff when everything nodes becomes an integrated and stable thing in Blender, if it ever does. As a content creator, how do you manage work and free time? Do you work at a specific time or whenever? I don't have a specific time, I just work whenever I want to. 
I tend to get most of my work done within a few hours of waking up, but I don't force myself to work on something if I'm not really interested in it. This is something that I did actually talk about in my recent discussion video on procrastination. When will you go live again? Probably sometime within the next month. I did enjoy it quite a lot last time, it was really nice to have a more organic conversation with the audience, and it was also quite a lot of fun having like CG Matter and the others along as well. And for the last question I'll answer, what is your favourite video game of all time? Well I've got quite a few favourites, but I think the award is a tie between Mercenaries Playground of Destruction and the second Ratchet and Clank game, which was actually given a different title here in the UK compared to the USA. Okay, that's where we're going to leave it for this video. Don't forget to pick up a copy of the free resources, and if you want to support me, then you can pick up the full version of the package. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure to follow me on all the platforms to keep up to date with new content, and links for everything can of course be found in the description. So thanks for watching, have a great day, and I'll see you next time.